First of all, I'm speaking as a crypto user and not as CEO of CoinMina. In crypto, you should never trust, you should always verify. So that's the first thing that I have in mind. I don't trust, I verify. Welcome, Ronis and Gaurav presenting What's Next, produced by CFTE. Our guest today, zooming in from Aman Jordan, is our dear friend Talal. Talal, welcome to the show. All right. Uh, thank you so much for having me, guys. It's uh, it's great to go from a viewer of the show to a speaker on the show. So thanks, thanks again for having me. See, I mean, you built companies, you worked in multiple countries, but now you really made it, right? You're being interviewed by <laughs> Gaurav. <laughs> hey, and you. <laughs> um, Talal, for the audience who doesn't know you, who don't know you, give us a brief background about who you are, what you do, what floats your boat. Hmm, okay. So my name is Talal. I'm a Jordanian engineer, um, I guess, of a mixed race, Jordanian and German. I guess I'm, if you ask friends who had, I don't have many German traits, probably more so on the Jordanian side. Um, yeah, i am uh, been married for a couple of years, starting a family now. But outside of that, I'm... Congratulations. Um, and you're yeah, doing this you. from, can I share? You're doing this from your wife's bedroom? Yes, that is correct. I just landed from Riyadh uh, and at my in-laws had lunch earlier and told them, okay. hey, I need a podcast. I need an, a quiet room. So, uh, yeah, here I am in, in Tamara's room recording. Um, we don't have an office, so I'm very used to working from random places. If you ask my friends, you know, yeah, Talal could pull out the laptop and start working or do an interview or whatever. So, uh, yeah, flexibility is a very big part of uh, my personality and, and the way I live. But anyway, to to give you a summary, um, I've been working. Uh, crypto is 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 has been my passion for the past probably seven years. Mm -hmm. um, so I was born and raised in Jordan. Was very lucky uh, that my parents were able to afford to send me to study in the U.S., uh, where I went to Purdue University. Uh, did engineering there, industrial engineering. Worked three months in a top pharmaceuticals company, but realized that manufacturing really isn't for me. Um, and then I, I went into finance. I, I moved to PwC in Abu Dhabi. Uh, that's when I first started uh, my career. I spent a bit of time in Chicago after Purdue, but really I started my career with, with PwC, uh, moved to work in Saudi uh, for, a, uh, for a family office there. And that's when I really started getting into crypto and figuring out that there's a big gap in the Middle East. Um, for, yeah, basically moved from Saudi to Switzerland, uh, 2016, 17, uh, was heavily involved in building products uh, that are Ethereum based, uh, set up a company called Gibril with my partner, and then did a bit of Bitcoin mining in, in, in Kuwait and other countries. And really, um, CoinMina was essentially the, uh, yeah, ended up listening to the market and stopped being stubborn because everyone was asking, how do I buy Bitcoin? How do I sell Ethereum? How do I buy USDT? Um, yeah, I guess that's that's a bit about me and passionate about uh, using crypto to provide a more equal uh, and honest financial network. How did you get involved in crypto? Were you just hanging around in Crypto Valley in Switzerland, imbibing this all? Or were you sitting in Saudi trying to work out how to get money cross-border to Jordan effectively for your friends or were you yeah, just involved so, in scammy ICOs or what were you doing? And Actually, my first ever interaction with Bitcoin was uh, fake ID related. Uh, that is, I think, something that I have not disclosed heavily, but that's the first time I heard it. Uh, I didn't buy a fake ID. I did not transact in any illicit activities in or any regulators are listening <laughs> or, or my really compliance clear. officer that's listening <laughs> but really, actually the, the, the first time i ever heard about bitcoin it was one of the guys in university that wanted to buy a fake id using bitcoin um i, I was a fake id to buy beer underage or what was going on yeah, so i was wow. i was about 21 so i did not have that issue um a good old us drinking laws yeah yeah so that was the first time i heard about it but honestly i didn't didn't buy didn't like didn't transact just take it was a passing thought and yeah. then in 2014 or 2000 and yeah 2014 my younger brother was in university and mm -hmm. he had a professor called bruce fenton who's 
uh, Bitcoin OG, oh. etc. And Bruce asked everyone in class to open a blockchain.com wallet and send each of them some Bitcoin. Obviously, it was a small amount of Bitcoin, but uh, my brother Hashem called me up. He's like, remember this crazy idea you told me about Bitcoin? He's like, yeah, I have some. Um, and he's like, yeah, you should probably you know, look into it. So yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for Hashem for uh, reminding me of, of, of something that I had heard of several years ago and, and kind of forgot about. So uh, that was when the rabbit hole uh, consumed me, essentially. So I used to work at PwC. Um, many of my friends used to work at PwC, now own healthy amounts of Bitcoin. Um, as you can probably tell from the first, I don't know, 10 minutes of this podcast, pretty talkative guy. So if you know about something like Bitcoin, it's became, yeah, I guess if you ask some people around me, they, they might say it's a bit annoying, but I had to uh, let them know how I felt, I guess. For, yeah, I, I um, that was working another job. So I was with PwC and then I worked for an uh, investment company in Saudi. All that time, I was um, basically spending most of my time uh, uh, doing re reading white papers, learning how to code and failing miserably, um, and participating in... Actually, I'm probably one of the people that has participated in the most ICOs ever because, uh, yeah, I think it's you know, yeah, almost a thousand, if, if not more. So no... Because I wanted to do an ICO and I wanted to know how others do it. So I would put the minimum investment amount so that I see what does the flow look like? What does the, did they do KYC or not? Um, but yeah, I have I have some, uh, if you ask my partner, yeah, there's some craziness, but at the end of the day, there's, yeah, there's, there's some extreme, but I think you have to have some extreme elements with a level head in order to make it, let's say. Yeah. But but Ronit, do, you know, I have to ask him one question: Is is oh, you know you too. you were working? Yeah, you're working for PwC and all these people. Your job had nothing to do with what you were learning and about crypto. So the job you were doing was related to your mechanical industrial degree, uh, or what were you doing at those places? Was it so far apart from your learning, or wasn't it? Yeah. So uh, I studied industrial engineering, which if you ask a real engineer. They will tell you industrial engineer is an imaginary engineer because we don't do a lot of hard work engineering stuff. But honestly, I had no issues with that. My chemical engineers, uh, friends so, such as my partner, Yazan, uh, used to give me shit for that. And I basically <laughs> would say it's okay because industrial engineers end up hiring you. Uh, because, <laughs> but that's, uh, yeah, so I guess I did the engineering that was closest to business, which is industrial engineering. And I guess there's, there's which I guess, I'm sure there's two parts. There's the optimization element, which is very much operations and not necessarily manufacturing. And then there's the manufacturing side. So um, I actually think industrial engineering is a great base. You don't need to work in factories. You don't need to work in uh, manufacturing. Many people go to finance or other, other aspects. It's, um, but with PwC, I was a junior consultant and uh, pretended to know what I'm talking about, essentially. Like, what does a first-year uh, consultant know? They just, you know, repackage, recycle presentations in a nice way. And if you're confident enough and you have to, you can convince the client, they'll actually accept a lot of the crap you're sending their way. Um, yeah, I guess consulting was a was a great eye-opening experience. And you know, the world is not what I thought it was. Uh, especially when consulting for banks, mm. uh, a few central banks as well. Like, really, that's how you do your business? Um, for, uh, yeah, I guess that, so you, you mentioned crypto didn't really have much to do with PwC, but, uh, on the face of it, yes, but really when looking at financial institutions and seeing how their core banking systems work and how the reconciliation and settlement happens and Nostro and Vostro accounts, and I used to use Bitcoin and uh, USDT, I was lucky to meet, uh, one of the founders early on before they, uh, sold it off. Um, for, I guess I was aware that this triple accounting uh, system, which is an you know, open public blockchains, can solve a lot of the problems that banks face. Now, I want to get into like building of CoinMina, but I think um, before we do that, I'd love to hear more about the thousand ICOs. What did you learn from all that process? I mean, how many of those were frauds and scams? How many of those led to use cases that had utility? Did you learn stuff? What did you learn? Essentially, what I learned is um, there's a trade-off between everything. Like life yeah. is trade. Life is basically about trade-offs. If mm -hmm. I look at Dubai financial markets, DFM, there is 
a lot of friction, but not a lot of um, velocity of capital. What do I mean? I, three years ago, when I did this exercise, DFM, you needed to go write like a document in order to buy a stock. Mm. Or certain stock brokers in other countries, you need to actually, like, let's think of a traditional stock brokerage, uh, stock exchange. Some of them needed you to go sign a document in order to buy, and it takes you two weeks to open the accounts. There's mm. so much investor protection, but it's very difficult to access it. It's very difficult for velocity to be high. So it is like if you wanted to put like a matrix, this goes above and beyond on user uh, protection, like investor mm. right protection, but it's not that great from a velocity, uh, acceptance, target addressable market. Like someone in Venezuela can't really participate on DFM. On the other polar opposite with ICOs, it provided absolutely no investor protection. Like you people with their outright scams, EOS raids like three and a half billion dollars and did nothing basically. For, uh, uh, ICOs don't give a lot of investor protection and you have to depend on the team's uh, integrity, their ability to deliver. And there is not a lot of traditional methods of protecting what's right or what your right is. Because when you're buying a stock, you have right of information, you have uh, commercial rights, you have right to vote. With tokens, all of that stuff is vague. So uh, again, in that element, you have almost no investor protection, but you have capital formation at an insane difference. Like it's riding a camel to work or taking an A38. Like one of them is very efficient and one of them is uh, like one of them is very fast and one of them is very slow. So ICOs from a capital formation standpoint are closer to A380s. Why? Because you can raise literally minimum can be $1. You can raise from all across the world and all you need is an internet freaking connection as opposed to, are you a qualified investor or not? Are you a What's your mom's blood type? What did your dad have for lunch? Like all these types of questions that come in and, and no, I'm, that's an exaggeration, but uh, trying to make a point on how with ICOs, capital mm -hmm. formation was seamless, yet it offered no investor protection. So in my opinion, this is like the simplest way humans work is kid touching a hot stove. I got scammed many times before. Now I know better. So maybe that's not the best way for things to progress, but that is the reality of it. So I personally, like what I learned from those ICOs is everything in life is a trade-off. I do think ICOs will make a comeback once there's a cash flows being generated on chain. Because the biggest difference, like my biggest issue with ICOs is you're saying you have this token on the blockchain that represents X, but X is in the traditional world. If that cash flow can be natively done on chain, then you can direct it to the relevant uh, token holders. Um, another thing I learned is that uh, people are greedy. And that's another thing I learned from, no. from ICOs. <laughs> uh, yeah, what, what a <laughs> experience. Um, and, um, and yeah, marketing is, uh, yeah, I guess we, we kind of knew these things, which is why I kept them to the end. Uh, not as exciting as the trade-off one, but really, uh, you know, um, viral marketing is, if you're trying to sell a product, you are going to make a profit margin of X. If you're doing a token sale, then that money is technically fundraising. So it's it's marketing for fundraising versus marketing for a product. So it, it uh, yeah, I guess that taught me uh, different types of marketing lead you to uh, the, yeah, the, out, the way you market will lead you to a specific outcome. Um, and yeah, again, that's something we implemented in CoinMina. Referrals seems to be, I'm not a marketing expert by any means. Like I told you, I did industrial engineering and I worked in finance um, and, and, and crypto. But marketing is not really my thing. But my humble opinion is referrals seems to be the best one if you can align your customer acquisition costs and lifetime value of the customer. And happy to dig into that. And that's basically how we grow CoinMina's uh, uh, customer base. And um, yeah, that's that's what I learned from ICO. Could you explain a little bit more about what, you know, where is CoinMina based? Where is it regulated, licensed, um, particularly so that the viewers can call the relevant regulators and point out all these wonderful things you're saying here about. Of course. So CoinMina is a regulated uh, crypto exchange that focuses on fiat currencies to crypto. So um, we have a holding company that owns two subsidiaries. One subsidiary is in Bahrain and one subsidiary is in Dubai. The Bahraini subsidiary is a fully regulated uh, category three uh, exchange. 
And as a category three exchange, you are able to act in investment as an agent, principal, arrange custody, portfolio management, so a wide range of services. But in a nutshell, what it allows you to do is it allows you to basically deposit your hard earned cash in order to buy Bitcoin, Ethereum, or one of the 50 assets that we have listed. On the other side, you can deposit your crypto and sell it to Dirham, Rial, Bahraini, Kuwaiti, Dollar, etc. So it is a compliant, regulated, safe, reliable way of moving between fiat to crypto and crypto to fiat. We have a mobile app and a web application, and we also have an OTC service that uh, that basically runs on WhatsApp. And that's been very, very popular in, in, in the Middle East. So if you have cash and you want to go, sorry, we don't accept cash. We accept wire transfers only. So you have three ways of depositing into CoinMina. You can deposit via card. You can deposit via wire transfer to our client money account, or you can deposit via crypto. Um, and essentially, um, we have uh, very regular reporting with uh, the Central Bank of Bahrain. And now, inshallah, with VARA, we... Um, I guess will hopefully be one of the first local exchanges to be fully regulated. We are currently with the MVP program of VARA and hoping to move that to the full market product license, which will allow us to target uh, users across uh, the United Arab Emirates. Um, yeah, so basically that's that's Coinmina in a nutshell. If you look at on-chain analytics, we now process the most volume out of local exchanges. Um, that's something that I guess caught some investors by surprise. But uh, one one exchange had their license withdrawn. Uh, the other exchange has uh, its own issues, I guess. Uh, we wish them all the best. But from day zero, we said that we're coming to become the number one exchange in the region. And that also includes the foreign players. So we haven't beaten the foreign players yet, but that's certainly our goal. Um, yeah, that's, that's CoinMe in a nutshell. Awesome. I, I want to dig into a little bit about the building of CoinMina and that journey, but I want to get Gaurav uh, to take over the conversation as he's got much more operational experience than me. So we're going to hand the mic over to 500 startups, Gaurav, to <laughs> group 1,000 <laughs> ICOs, Talal. Just for our listeners, just for them to know context of what VARA is, V-A-R-A, that's the Virtual uh, Authority on Regulated Assets, Virtual Assets Regulated Authority, sorry, based mm. out of the UAE. It is essentially an independent organization which looks to cater to everything regarding uh, blockchain, Web3, uh, and crypto from a regulated point of view for consumers and businesses uh, that has essentially uh, comprised of a lot of very, very, very intelligent and entrepreneurial uh, global uh, regulators uh, that have come together in that space to work very closely with people like Talal and his company, uh, you know, which is why UAE is becoming such a leader in the metaverse today. So that's just a context background. But Talal, coming back to Coin Mina, right? I mean, you've set this up. You want to run forward. Uh, you've built products and services. But, you know, what does that look like today? We are a mobile first, Arabic first product which means realistically we will focus on countries that speak Arabic first because that's our bread and butter. We have 24 hour customer service. We have Koimi University in Arabic. So if a customer wants to have a premium private banking like experience, when we started Coinmina, it was a crypto exchange that will offer a wide range of crypto services. But it's very important that you are not stubborn. And I tried to make myself less stubborn over time and try to be humble with uh, the data that you get, 75% of all blockchain transactions are stable coins. So essentially, when we started CoinMina, we thought that we're going to be selling ETH, BTC, XRP, whatever for traders. But the reality is all crypto exchanges are now acting as FX brokers because they trade USDT against local fiat pairs, either USD, Dirham, Rial, etc. So um, we've become very aware of that and uh, have spent most of our time setting up proper on-ramps and off-ramps, which means if you come to CoinMina today, we will be able to accept Dirham, process Dirham. Same for every other uh, currency that we have. And um, yeah, I guess the, the, the user experience at CoinMina is, can be on the mobile app, can be on the web app or on WhatsApp. And I would say WhatsApp is the one that's been surprisingly the most uh, successful so far. My next question might come across uh, as crude to start with, but it's not really. It's meant to just unpack your business from a historical and structural point of view. Why should people trust you? And what do I mean by that is, 
you know, when I come to CoinMina, you know, the whole crypto space is so young. It's not a personal question or, 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 or a targeted question. What I want to understand from you is how old is your business? Tell us oh, yeah, about right. your company, your structure, your people. How big are you now? How many years have you been around? Yeah, yeah. so uh, first of all, first of all, I'm speaking as a crypto user and not as CEO of CoinMina. In crypto, you should never trust. You should always verify. So that's the first thing that I have in mind. I don't trust, I verify. Yeah, you should not trust, you should verify. And I even tell that to our customers. Buy Bitcoin, withdraw it. If you yeah. if, withdraw your crypto. For, um, for, okay, let me tell you a bit about CoinMina's credentials. So essentially, the first thing we thought of is if we're going to be regulated, we need to be regulated by a proper body that has uh, that has a strong reputation. So we went for the Central Bank of Bahrain, who we felt were years ahead of any other regulator. Um, we started the process during COVID. Uh, again, not uh, sitting at the home, easiest I, time yeah, to engage a regulator. Sure. Time. Yeah. So we got licensed by uh, the Central Bank of Bahrain towards the end of 2021. I think in August, May. Sorry, May, and then August we did our launch. So 2021 was our kind of launch year. 2022 is when we did growth, and then in 2023 we we're focused on profitability, sustainable business, risk management, etc. So. Um, CoinMina is regulated by the Central Bank of Bahrain. Out of 300 plus applicants, there's only three licensed exchanges. Oh, wow. uh, it's CoinMina, Rain, and Binance. Um, for the Central Bank of Bahrain, in my opinion, has a very strong, stringent, comprehensive framework that does allow me, I store a lot of my crypto at CoinMina. So this is something that, uh, I guess, put your money where your mouth is kind of thing. Um, and we deal with so we know what we're good at and we know what we're not good at. So I think that traditional finance absolutely nailed it in terms of separating custody and execution. So if you go to Binance, to Coinbase, to Kraken, they are an exchange and they are the custodian, which in my opinion should not happen. If you look at the stock market, NASDAQ doesn't custody stocks. It's sitting in the DTC, the deposit trust company, because there has to be that separation. I think that trading and execution should be separate, which is why we do our custody at BitGo. So BitGo okay. is our qualified custodian. We have hot wallets and cold wallets at BitGo that are also insured. And then any fiat that is deposited into CoinMina today sits in client money accounts in our bank in Bahrain, which is Bank of Bahrain and Kuwait. So um, you have, from a counterparty risk standpoint, your client money assets are separated from CoinMina's balance sheet, and they're sitting in a bankruptcy remote uh, accounts. But again, that's... When we started CoinMina, we knew that we needed to be a profitable business in order to remove the stress. So companies that have customer custodial funds and are losing money are essentially at the mercy of their venture investors. So we said, we told our Series A investors we're gonna, or, or pre-Series A investors, we, we didn't do a Series A. Uh, we will raise money, turn profitable, and then we will ride the wave, whether it's up or down. And um, yeah, you mentioned a bit on size and gray hair. So... Basically, we do have gray hair in our team. I think it is extremely important to have people that have worked in banking, in exchange houses, FX brokers. So we do bring expertise from uh, traditional finance. However, I think the majority of the risk mitigation work is actually in automation. And I'll go back to the earlier example about wanting to buy a fake ID. Back in those days when uh, my friend wanted to, to do that, there were no checks and balances. There were no KYT checks in order to ensure that the deposit you're sending or the, yeah, the, the money you're sending or the money you're receiving is actually compliant. Today at CoinMina, we're plugged into several top-notch KYT providers that essentially block any outgoing or incoming transactions from high and severe risk addresses. So for example, if you try to send your money to, um, I don't know, like a black market to buy a fake ID. The withdrawal would not even go from CoinMina. And there's no officer to do that. It's a fully automated process. So we do believe that uh, combining uh, tech and people is the best way to do it. And again, hats off to Central Bank of Bahrain for this process is we have zero automated onboarding at CoinMina. Essentially, that shocked me. And hey, guys, I want to scale. I want to be able to onboard so many customers. I'm like, nope, too easy to be gamed. So essentially, we have a system which automates everything, but then a compliance officer sitting in Bahrain has to review the application, see that it makes sense, and then click approve. And There's your verify part right there. How big is your team now? 
How many people? We're, in we're 32. Uh, total of yeah, 32, 34. Uh, yeah. But we're a decent sized team. I actually think that because um, we're a remote first company. I think the only way to efficiently run a remote first company is you have to be understaffed. Because if not, people are going to coast. Like we have one designer at CoinMina. If Usma doesn't do his job, we're screwed. Like the, the developer. <laughs> so 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 uh, cheers to Usma for always giving us the best designs in the industry. But uh, yeah, so so we I would say we're a very lean team, and um, with the bull market we will scale. But at least now we've built the the core base. You're talking about profitability. Um, very early. How old is CoinMina now? How many years old? So we launched in August 2021. Okay. Uh, first year was mainly testing the pipes, yep. um, making sure everything works. 2022 is when we aggressively went after the market. So we spent a lot on marketing. Um, and we've been, I guess, year one was a bit of a loss. But year two, we tripled our revenue with a bit of a loss. This year, we will triple our revenue with yeah about 40% gross profit margin. Wow. So you'll be you'll be gro- profitable this by the end of this year. No, we're, we're profitable on a weekly basis in 2023. Oh wow! Congratulations. So you're no, not your... congratulations yet. Not congratulations. I think if you open a company, the bare minimum you need to do is to be profitable. Great. So, but you're backed by venture capital, aren't you? Yes, yes. We're proud to be backed by Beko Capital, and uh, yeah, they've they've been super supportive. We've had some turbulent times with the FTX drama and crypto and the ambiguity, and uh, yeah, I think uh, inshallah, if I do another company, the first door I will knock will be Beko. So looking at the fact that, you know, you're profitable, you're backed by venture capital, right? You haven't raised your series A yet. I guess it's going to come at some point and different people will will participate. And you've got other investors on board apart from Beko, correct? You've got a cap table of, of people who are helping you with the business. Beko is a very notable group that's obviously helped you a lot, but you've got other people there as well. What's next for Coinmia? Because today you've got a baseline of customers. I'll dig into the customers, but before that, I wanted to maybe discuss the investors. So we are sure. proud to have uh, Beko as, I guess, our biggest ticket, but we also have Arab Bank Switzerland, which has been a great partner. We oh, have, wow. uh, yeah, so Arab Bank Switzerland, they invested in our first uh, ticket. We've had um, Kinetic Capital out of Hong Kong. Jihan, amazing guy, also on our cap table. Um, we have Bunat Ventures, uh, who's uh, very active uh, in Saudi Arabia, and um, yeah, we've been, uh, and then we have an SPV with many angel investors from across the region, and uh, yeah, so we do have a, a, a few people on our cap table. Going back to you saying Series A is gonna come, I don't know if it's gonna come. If we keep generating cash flow, then my equity is valuable. I don't want to get diluted. So brilliant. We, yeah, so um, our competitors they raised hundred million, thirty five million, whatever. Um, I don't think that that is the best metric and um, we might continue to be profitable and then maybe one day explore a listing. You know, ADX, DFM, Tadawol, Numu, all of these markets will eventually need a compliant crypto player to go public. So nice. uh, I guess I have somewhat of a, yani I don't like the concept of setting up a company to sell it to my rich American friend. Like, I don't want to do that. You know, I, why, why? In no ish. Like, are we that, not that, that, not, no. Are we not uh, confident in our abilities? Why? And la- don't get me wrong. If I get a $2 billion offer, I will sell my shirt as well with the company. If I, you know, that's, that's not, not trying to sound arrogant, but that can't No, no, wrong. that's, that's the way the, con- the construct and approach is. So yeah. it's clear. The message so, is well received, brother. Uh, thank you. <laughs> on, on the customer side, on the customer side, um, during the bear market, you have uh, like exuberance does not exist. No one is hearing about Bitcoin at their barber these days, even though maybe in 2017, 2018, you would hear it at your barber and then at your grandma's lunch, very different types of people both talking about Bitcoin. So that's not the case today. Um, today, it's people that are either truly benefiting from the use case people that are making arbitrage and buying in one place and selling it in in another place, uh, uh, capitalizing on the inefficiency of of, of supply and demand across countries. And then you have the third and my favorite, which are people that are buying for the long term, people that are buying 
Bitcoin with one, two percent of their uh, total investable assets and putting it in cold storage. We we at CoinMina, I think, have been able to unlock a, a, a great amount of, of those customers. And um, yeah, I guess those those would be the, the, the main ones. I do expect that as markets, hopefully when markets turn around and we have a bit more liquidity in the market and um, the world kind of breaks because of these high interest rates and we go back to the printing press, then we'll see the emergence of, uh, I guess, altcoins and um, uh, NFTs come back to play. And I don't know if we'll see the same hype, but I'm confident that with every crypto cycle, there will be one sub vertical where people are very excited about. Could be AI, could be DeFi, could be, we don't know yet. But I think it it uh, it will eventually happen. But the way that I'm, what I'm trying to really get to as a question when I say, what is your customer base today? Are you increasing your customer base or are you increasing the products you're uh, servicing your customer base with? What I'm trying to understand is, as a company that's geared into profitability and on profitability and growth, you can't keep building the same mousetrap and expect new revenue to come in, especially when new players will constantly be attracted by the, the market and the regulator like Vara to compete with you. And then the only thing that separates you is the same margin pressures, right? So in order to escape margin pressures, you have to be either servicing a larger audience to build your revenue streams, or you have to build new products and services for those existing customers. So what's the approach for CoinMina going forward? Very, very valid question. So I think there's both uh, vertical, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, vertical. There's there's horizontal and then there's vertical uh, expansion. Uh, in terms of vertical expansion, I do think that, so we're working on a B2B offering as well. Not, some, not something that we had initially thought of when we started the company, but because of the sheer amount of incoming requests, we've decided to build it. So that's something that we will hopefully announce in Q1 or Q2 of next year. And that will empower other companies to essentially offer crypto services. Um, and then from a product standpoint, we had initially uh, put the wait list for a Visa card where you can spend your crypto. But again, we tried to follow the data and we ended up deprioritizing that project because FTX had marketed their card heavily in the Middle East and it became somewhat of a stigma and no crypto cards. Oh, and then Binance's card didn't do as well, I guess. Crypto.com's card used to be the best thing on Visa. Now it's not. So we've slightly postponed the the the, the Visa card, but that's something that we will bring back for sure. Um, I think the natural progression is going to become, we have your retail focused app, which becomes a neo bank essentially without being a bank. Like, where you can stake your crypto, you can lend it out to make yield, you can spend it using a Visa card, and you can deposit and withdraw all on chain. So that's something that uh, I think is a massive opportunity. Um, and using that, you can also expand geographically. So uh, our target addressable market remains the Middle East. Um, so I think we'll have two distinct offerings. One is the retail focused app that acts as uh, all in one finance app on chain and then you have your b2b offering which includes your otc desk the b2b product itself um and then a, a few other interesting projects we're doing with regulated institutions from my side that i'd love to understand is we've talked about this region we've talked about how this region needs a unique approach for for business even with a new business technically like yours right how would you say you know from your customer segment what you're servicing there's something that you feel, you know, besides just being, let's say, Arabic speaking first, what else in your product offering do you think you are building today uh, for the consumer specifically, for the person using your app, that nobody else, Kraken, Binance, nobody else is is, is providing or will deliver? So um, it's not really in our app, but it's part of our core offering. And that is... Uh, essentially execution and support via WhatsApp. It might sound trivially, trivial, it might sound stupid, but the reality is there are many, so this targets a specific, yeah, I guess, let, let me take a step back. Our unique value proposition varies from customer profile to customer profile because Binance's value proposition is deep liquidity. That can be applied to all aspects of your business. Kraken have a US banking license that can be applied to all of your run. 
In Coin Nina, we had to be more nimble. We had to be more customized because we don't have the billions of dollars that they do have. So, for example, um, our OTC customers that are Arabic speakers, we offer uh, WhatsApp support where they can do 24-hour execution on WhatsApp. We have customers that literally place their orders via voice note, like buy five Bitcoin market rate. And we upload that as an order confirmation. Uh, and it has to come from the WhatsApp number that was verified on, on, on Coin. Wow. Mina. So that essentially private banking type experience is something that we provide and others don't. Um, I guess one thing that is boring but super important is that uh, consistency of deposits and withdrawals. Before before Coin Mina, uh, one of my mentors was like, you should read a book called Only the Paranoid Survive by uh, Dell, the, the founder of Dell. And that is such a good book for, for any startup founder. And uh, that led me to opening, I think, six accounts for each currency. So uh, we have eight currency. I, my accounting team hates me for this. Uh, <laughs> and, but that means you will always get your money with CoinMina because we if, if one bank has an issue, we have, Adi, I'll take the next one, next one, next one, next one. So um, that is something that is, like we we are not very cheap. Uh, we we have maybe hundred basis points uh, fee in, in in total. And if you're gonna pay that fee, then you need to get a top private banking style service, and you need to make sure that your money goes in and out smoothly. So those are the boring yet difficult things that we excel at. I know your investors will do that first, but hey, we'll hope to see you again. And congratulations and best luck for the rest, Ronit. I'm gonna pass the mic back to you, brother. Thanks so much. Great stuff. Um, just as we wrap up this session, Talal, when you look forward, I mean, is this your life's work? This coin mean venture, this profitable regional, you've, 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 you've achieved product market fit in the region. Uh, you, you're doing effectively tokenized FX broking, as you called it, but you've got this wonderful, like locally customized Arabic language service. And it's making money. Um, obviously, we've not verified this statement, so you're going to take it on trust. But, you know, you're in a place where you don't have to run to the market to get funded. Um, you know, it's not a burning platform. You can build this and grow. Is this the big thing or are there other things in the future of, you know, Talal that we should be looking out for? Uh, the... I can never... The start? Chapter two? I can never confine myself to one thing. I'm a man of many interests. Okay. Uh, I love... Sports, I love prediction markets, I love farms, I love augmented reality. These are all things that I would eventually uh, do from a personal, professional, whatever you want to call it. So I do want to own a farmland eventually. Uh, okay. I do want to do something in augmented reality. I do want to something in gaming and prediction markets. Uh, I actually think that crypto will be cross industry. Like, imagine <laughs> now, oh, Allah, do you work in the internet space? Like, no mm. one. I work in agriculture, I use the internet. I work in banking exactly. and I use the internet. Similarly, I think crypto for me is something that is be going to become cross-industry and I will use it in anything else that I do in the future. But if you ask me, my wife, anyone around me, cons CoinMina does consume most of my mental and emotional, eh, emotional not so much at these days, <laughs> but the mental uh, capacity. Then we go to chapter three or chapter four in the life of Talal, the entrepreneur. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure to have you on. My pleasure. Thanks, bro. Have a wonderful day. And thank you for listening and putting up with all our silly questions, particularly <laughs> mine. I know Gaurav is sensible, but... Uh... All right. Thanks, guys. Have thank you. Day. See you in Dubai. Thank you. Bye-bye.